All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Unleashing Potentials podcast. So joining me today is Aretha. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Aretha Boomer, and I am from New York City. Hi, welcome. I'm so happy to have you on the podcast to share your story and what you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Uh, so, Aretha, can you tell us more about you, your story, and what you're doing in the community? Sure. So, I am from New York City. I am currently a clinical social worker, and I provide therapy to families and children in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Um I grew up in the foster care system since the age of 10 years old. I'm sorry, since the age of six years old, because mm -hmm. both of my parents had drug addictions and my siblings and I were separated um, for about 20 years up until 2017. Mm -hmm. um, I've also experienced bullying, homelessness, among other situations. And in terms of how I serve my commun community, I would just say by providing therapy to families and children. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I also volunteer and I provide food to like people that's homeless or I have done meals on wheels where you deliver meals to like the elderly people in the community. Mm -hmm. So I've also done that. I am also very active in my church. So I do identify as a Christian mm -hmm. and I serve in my church as a praise dancer. And I also assist the, um, the youth team. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. All, you, all the stories and things that you've gone through and are doing in your community. Um, let's go back to your childhood. What was it like growing up? And how has it shaped you into the woman that you are today? So I would say it was a balance of both. So I've had a lot of great moments um, with my adoptive family. Um, there were a few family members that I had a really good relationship with for the most part. And then on the other hand, it was really difficult because I didn't know my biological family because I was separated and taken away at six years old. Mm -hmm. And I got adopted by the age of 10 years old, but I didn't know like my birth mother. I didn't know where my biological father was or my family. Um, my younger sister, Shakira Smith, at the time she was four and I was six. At some point, she was removed from the home, and I didn't really want to go from home to home to home, so I ended up just staying at the home I was at. Mm -hmm. At that time, I had a pretty good relationship with my adoptive mom. However, as I became older, our, our relationship dynamics changed a lot, mm -hmm. Um. And it was it was really tough because I found myself looking for affirmation and love and, you know, relationships with men. I've made a lot of mistakes as a result of that. Um, I didn't know who I was. And anytime people will say, oh, you know, you remind me of this person or you look like that person. Mm -hmm. For regular people, it will probably be a compliment or something of that sort. But for me, it was it was a deeper experience because I'm like, oh, that could be my sister. That could be my aunt. You know, that could be my cousin. Mm -hmm. So it was really difficult for me to grow up not knowing who my biological family was. Mm -hmm. I did experience a lot of bullying. Um, and in addition to that, unfortunately, I've been jumped a few times um, in, in my neighborhood. So that was a really hard experience to go through. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say the main thing that helped me get through it is my faith and my relationship with God. So I did grow up in the church. Um, I was always active in the church. I started out as a choir member, I always loved gospel music since I was a young girl. 
Mm -hmm. I also started to praise dance in church. Um, so that is like my foundation, just leaning into God and just understanding that he's not responsible for man's actions because everyone have a free will and how they live their life is how they exercise their free will. Um, so just really leaning into God's unconditional love for me. Um, mm -hmm. and I always had a love for dance. So I also grew up dancing in the community. I was a part of an after school in East Harlem mm -hmm. and we used to compete against other after schools mm -hmm. in high school. I also dance as well. I was on a competitive dance team and, um, our dance team, cheerleading team and stepping team will compete against other high schools within different boroughs so that was a really good experience so mm -hmm. I would say contribute to the woman I am today because it taught me how to be more kind mm -hmm. in the most weirdest way because I have every right to be cruel um and just angry with the world but it taught me to be more kind because I know that I didn't always have that. I know that people wasn't always kind to me. So I do my best to be kind to people. Um, I do my best to be thoughtful towards people and to be empathetic because mm -hmm. since I've made a lot of mistakes, I know that I want grace when I make mistakes. And so I try to also give grace to others. Mm -hmm. Just like I ask for grace from them. Um, and it also solidified my faith in God. Mm -hmm. Wow. I love your story. I love your passion and everything that you've been through, how you turned that into victory to help people, to be a voice for them and to help them heal in a place that you've been through and can understand. I was also adopted. I've also been in the foster care system. Um, no, I've never been homeless, but I believe it was almost at that point back in uh, my home country in Haiti. And um, you were also bullied. I was bullied more so with racial discrimination, which is also a different form of bullying. Um, you must be so proud of the woman you've become today. Yes, I would say I am. Um because I know the amount of internal work that I've had to do mm -hmm. to get to this point, a lot of reflection, a lot of prayer, a lot of hard conversations with myself. Mm -hmm. I tend to reflect daily on my interactions with people. And I don't necessarily think about what others have done or what they've said so much. I mainly focus on what I could have done better or if I said something and I'm like, well, you could have said that more kinder. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to be that direct, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, because um, I could be really assertive at times. Um, I always mean well, I, I could be, you know, very blunt um, and I could come off too aggressive at times. So I really try to just self-reflect because I'm only responsible for my words and my actions mm -hmm. and how I handle people. So I try to be really mindful of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I've accomplished a lot in spite of what I've gone through. Um, I'm about to be 32 in a few months. Mm -hmm. My 20s consisted a lot of highs and lows a lot of grief. I've lost a lot of close family members. That's when I became homeless. I was homeless for two years. I lived in three different shelters with over 500 women. Wow. Um, and the fact that I got my apartment was a miracle all in itself. Mm -hmm. So yes, I would say I'm really proud of myself. And then I finished college I got my master's in social work and that was a journey as well mm -hmm. that's amazing did you know that I also wanted to be a social worker that's what I went to school for wow that's I really didn't awesome. finish, though I do plan on going back at some point 
I did not, I could not finish. It wasn't by choice. I got very, very, very mentally ill and physically ill. I'm still sort of sick. People can't tell, but I'm just pushing through just like you have. And it's my passion. I couldn't finish, but I've gained and learned so much from just the years that I had um, learning about social work. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry you couldn't finish. Um, it's never too late, though. Yes. So even if you wanted to go back to the, back to it mm -hmm. and do it like part time or like, you know, one or two classes, mm -hmm. that yeah. would be good. Mm -hmm. That yep. would be really, really good. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Um, I want to touch on different things that you, you brought up just to kind of expand it a little bit more uh, to talk about it in depth. Let's talk about homelessness. That's, that's hard for anybody to be homeless, right? Did you find that when you were at that place, how did pr people view you? You know, some people in society, they look down upon those who are homeless or, you know, don't have what they have. Did you still find that there were people who believed in you, regardless of where you were at the time? So interestingly enough, most people didn't know I was homeless at the time. <laughs> okay. Um, they didn't know. Um, only the people very, very close to me mm -hmm. knew about the situation. Mm -hmm. And they didn't judge me. They knew the background of how I ended up homeless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the way I conducted myself was the same way prior to the situation. So mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of money because, you know, I was working retail job. I was working at Marshall's. I was a cashier mm -hmm. receiving minimum wage. And at that time it was like seven fifty, So it wasn't a lot of money, but I did yeah. the best I could to like keep up with my parents mm -hmm. and I did my best to like serve people regardless. So I was still going to church, mm -hmm. even walking down the street. If I saw someone that was street homeless, cause I was shelter homeless, but if I saw someone that was street homeless, I would still give to them. Um, I still was paying my tithes and my offering in church. So most people didn't know I was homeless. So they, they really couldn't, give an opinion about it by the time that they realized I was in that situation I was probably already in my apartment and it's like oh I didn't even know you was homeless because you was always smiling or you was always so kind like they didn't really they didn't really know mm -hmm. but for the people that did know like so my supervisors and my managers they were aware because I had to let them know I can't do any closing shift because I have a curfew, but I can work up until this time, but I will need a letter for the shelter so that they don't log me out because in a shelter, especially single women's shelter, if you're not there by like 10 PM, which was the curfew, you will lose your bed. And my schedule was until 945 and I worked in Manhattan but my shelter at the time was in the Bronx, which was like an hour commute. So I needed a letter so that they can excuse me for that hour. Mm -hmm. So with my managers, like, you know, they was very understandable. They didn't treat me any different. I was like voted friendliest cashier. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really hard to tell. It was really hard to tell. And even when I was homeless, I still had a lot of faith in God and mm. working at Marshall's like, you know, you have access to like discounts and things of that sort. And I would be looking around for like towels and washcloths. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to get this for my apartment. And that's mm. the kind of conversations I would have. So they're thinking, oh, you know, she has an apartment and I didn't have an apartment at the time. Mm -hmm. But I knew that God was going to open the door at some point. And so, like, I was preparing for it by faith. So people, my friends, didn't treat me any differently because, you know, we was friends. Um, but I do know, like, in society, like, living in New York City, um, homelessness, you know, is a really big social 
problem and a lot of people do treat homeless people very unfairly Mm -hmm. um so that is an issue for sure yeah um I'm sorry you went through that and I'm also I'm happy that you found support at your lowest even now I think all of us need those kind of people that were there to support you whether you were going through ups or down and um, you're right society do look down on homeless people I used to work at two major homeless shelters where I am right now in, in Canada and I was going to school as well. Um, it was a, v- a very rewarding job to do um, because some of the people I would meet and talk to, they were incredible people, incredible people uh, with profound stories. It was a job that when I left it, I felt my soul was happy, right? And I came home and I could go back and give more. And I also received from all of those beautiful souls that I used to work with there as well. Yeah. Um, You talk about your faith in God. I also believe in God. Was there ever a time that you you doubted your faith or what God God could do based on where you were at? I know I have. (laughs) I'm just being honest. Yeah, when I was in the shelter, um I was really angry at the time Mm -hmm. because once you are in foster care your guardian they receive payment to take care of you Mm -hmm. so I was upset because I was like you know my guardian they're receiving payments to take care of me and I'm still in the shelter while they're getting paid um, for me so I was upset about that and I was upset because I'm like I pay my tithes and offering I don't understand why I'm in this shelter and I had a lot of unforgiveness towards my adoptive mom at that time Mm -hmm. because of our relationship dynamics and to be honest with you when I had that unforgiveness in my heart towards her no doors was opening. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Nothing was happening. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, my basic needs were met, you know, so I had clothes and I had food, mm-hmm. but nothing else was happening in terms of like my housing situation changing. Mm-hmm. I remember like mm-hmm. there was like a church that came to the shelter and they was talking about God. I'm like, I don't want to hear what you have to say. Because we have to live here. Like, you're going to say what you need to say. You're going to leave. But we have to live here. Mm -hmm. So I was, like, really, really, really upset. Um, It wasn't until God, like, revealed to me that I had to let go of that, like, anger and bitterness. God had to reveal to me that I had to let that go. Mm -hmm. And he started to, like, help me through that. And at some point, like, my faith was rectified I would say or relived Mm -hmm. so yes I would say I've doubted God at some point um but I've always had faith I I think it was more I don't know if it was so much of doubt I think it was more so of like because I know how powerful you are I don't understand why you're allowing me to be in this situation Mm. I think it was more so of that because I've had faith in God I didn't understand why he allowed me to be in those situations Mm. but now looking back I can understand how it like shaped my character and how it like strengthened my relationship and my belief in God but yes it's not always easy to like maintain your faith in difficult moments that's why I try to like meditate on scriptures daily, listen to gospel music daily, mm-hmm. um, especially when I'm at work and reaffirm myself with the word of God and just reaffirm the promises over my life mm-hmm. because all of us are human. So we do have like high moments. We do have low moments. 
there are some situations where I still don't understand why God allowed me to go through them, mm -hmm. but I have to continue to trust his sovereignty and just understand that, you know, he's my heavenly father. And so he wants what's best for me and he understand what that has to like include from my, my life and my path. Yeah. Yeah. I want to thank you for being so honest authentic and open to the question I asked you uh, about lacking faith in God where you were, because not everyone would have answered that with such honesty, right? And that's what I strive for in the podcast is to hear the raw, absolute truth. I have also struggled uh, with doubts in the past, you know, when it comes to believing God. How can we continue to have faith when we are blind? You know, when we can't always see God, even though he's there, we can always see him. Yeah. And for me, because of the situations I've gone through, like I know God is real. So like once I... Okay, so let me back up. Mm -hmm. While I was homeless, I volunteered at a nonprofit organization as a foster care youth advocate. Mm -hmm. And by faith, the first thing I bought for my apartment was a flat screen TV. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to my best friend's house. And I'm like, you know, it's a great deal. I'm going to use this for my apartment. And I used to tell the staff members at the shelter, like, if God created heaven and earth, surely he could find me the apartment. And I remember the shelter I was in, they closed it down and they made it into a men's shelter. And I remember the driver telling me that they were sending me to the worst shelter, which was another shelter in East Harlem. And that particular shelter, you wasn't allowed to bring in any food um, but you could bring in a lot of candy it was like really gated they checked your you know they checked you they had you jump out your bags and stuff it felt like a prison and I remember the staff members saying like oh you know our taxes is what pay for you guys to be here just really really nasty wow. um it was only like one staff member that was like really really kind so I thank God for her And um, even when I was in the shelter, I worked three jobs. My day started at 3.50 in the morning. Mm -hmm. It ended at 9.45 p.m. I worked at least 60 hours. I also saved $5,000 by faith. Mm -hmm. And I had people tell me like, oh, you know, it's impossible to find an apartment under thousand like a thousand dollars in New York city. And I'm like, well, this is my budget. You know, God is going to have to do what God is going to have to do. Um, and I wrote down specifically like how I wanted the apartment to be. I'm like either one bedroom or studio. I want a safe environment. I don't want to be ducking and dodging because bullets are flying. I want it to be clean. Mm -hmm. Like I just gave, you know, what I desired in the apartment and the agency I was volunteering for, they kept calling this specific number. They kept calling. We finally got through. They asked me for certain documentation. I had everything prepared. I got accepted for the apartment. Um, and, and my apartment building is for young people that either age out of full secure youth or have like a mental health condition and some other criteria as supportive housing. Mm -hmm. um, we have a computer lab. We have laundry and dryer on site. We also have a backyard. My apartment was newly renovated um, and our rent is below market um, rent prices. Um, so just getting my apartment was a miracle all in itself and I've been in my apartment now for about 10 years and through different resources of the supportive housing like through my college journey they have helped me like pay for my books for college so when I like moved in I didn't even have a degree I only had a high school diploma 
-hmm. and now I have my master's so this entire journey I've been like pursuing my education Mm -hmm. um so it's, it's like so many things that I've gone through and it's so many ways God have made it's hard for me not to have faith because I'm like there's no person that could take credit for what God has done yes he has used people to help me along the way but if he didn't want the door to be open the door wouldn't have been open because when I was looking for apartments doors was closing doors was closing like I remember going to New Jersey which is a different state than New York Mm -hmm. by faith like I literally went to Jersey I took off from work I viewed uh, a apartment and they like, oh, you have the the income, but we don't know if you'll be able to pay this by yourself. And they completely rejected me. And I was upset. I'm like, you see, I'm trying to do this, like, and it's not working. Mm-hmm. Um, but it happened in his time. And, and mm-hmm. there's a scripture in the Bible that says God would do, God would do exceedingly and abundantly more than what you can ever ask or think Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what he did like the apartment I live in now it's more than what I prayed for and Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that God said no for the Mm -hmm. other doors I was trying to walk through Mm -hmm. because I would have robbed myself Mm -hmm. of the door that he opened which opened many other doors Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's incredible girl your proof that god exists your proof that anyone can overcome life's challenges and obstacle there's so much power in your story and what you're doing and how you're doing it there's no way anyone couldn't get some healing from what you do it, it's just from your heart it's from your experience and i love that now, now, thank you for sharing that with me and my audience. It's very, very powerful stuff you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. And I would like to also share one testimony too. Yes, please. Because when I was volunteering at the agency, I did a video on YouTube just to talk about my experience. And in this YouTube video, you see me with all my belongings because that's the moment where they kicked out all the women in the shelter because they shut it down Mm -hmm. and I did this YouTube video and all of those years I was looking for my biological family like I went to the agency Mm -hmm. and I asked about like my my sibling that my siblings that I was looking for but because we had a closed adoption they wasn't able to give me too much information Mm -hmm. one person was kind enough to give me their names so I would write their names on Facebook and I would say you know I'm praying for you guys I hope I meet you guys and then one day, randomly, the organization I volunteered for, like, years ago, they emailed me and they said, oh, your family member reached out to me. And I'm like, what? Like, what are they talking about? And then I called the person and it ended up being my cousin on my father's side. And then she called me Riri and the, the person, the people that called me that is my biological family. So I ended up flying out and meeting like my biological family from my father's side. And I met them in 2017. I was 26. I haven't been with my biological family for 20 years. And the way that they found me is through a YouTube video. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) That's crazy cool. Yeah, so out of all things God used, he used a YouTube video because when I did the video, um, they 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 looked up my name, the video popped up, and they saw the banner behind it says, you know, FPA contact this number, and they contacted that number. When I did that YouTube video, I would have never known that that that's how God was gonna reunify me with my biological family. Um so it's nine of us. Unfortunately, two of us passed away. One of them passed during 2020. Um, the other one passed before I got to meet him. My father passed away before I got to reunify with them as well. Um, but my other siblings are still alive. I've met most of my nieces and my nephews. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so that was one of like my heart's desire was to like reunify, to be reunified with my biological family. Um, I'm still looking for my younger sister. Her name is Shakira Smith. By now she should be 30. And I do believe God will like fulfill, you know, that promise as well and finish what he has started. But the fact that I found them and I used to post about them for years consistently by faith and try to look for them. And the fact that God used a YouTube video to like reunify me with them is a miracle. Um, one of the greatest titles I have is being an aunt <laughs> and I'm the only one right now without children. So I have about 10 plus nieces and nephews. So you know, when they say, oh, I love you, auntie, or happy birthday, auntie, or whatever, auntie, I'm like, I love this. Aww. And so, yeah, I know God is real because. Oh, my goodness. Girl, I'm so, I'm I'm happy, like, because I resonate and I can feel the power in your story. Um, It's, it's mind blowing. <laughs> I'm happy because there are so many people that are looking for their family through, whether it was through adoption or foster care or other situations. And for you to have found that you found home, the yeah. home that you've always been looking for, not a physical home, but your home, your family, your bloodline. That is so cool. That's yeah. so cool. Oh my goodness. Um, did you ever get to meet your bio mom by any chance? I know you mentioned your, your on your father's side, you did. I did. Um, unfortunately, when I met her, it was two weeks before my older brother was killed. He was killed in 2020. Um, and it was two weeks before I met her. Um and then when I met her again was the day he was killed. Mm -hmm. We're still working on our relationship. We don't really have a relationship now. Um, and that's because I'm not sure if she's at a point where she's ready to address how she contributes to the situation in terms of us being in foster care. I think we both have different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I think that she owes me and my siblings an apology mm -hmm. because of the situation. Mm -hmm. She believes that because all of us are grown that she doesn't owe us that apology. Mm -hmm. um, and I've made several attempts to have a relationship with her or more so of communication mm -hmm. um, that hasn't really gone too far. Mm -hmm. But I do believe um, at some point, God is going to reconcile our relationship. Mm -hmm. But until he does, like my main focus is to try my best to just work on my heart, um, God, my, to, to guard my heart mm -hmm. um, and allow God to do what only he can do within her because you can't like force a relationship you know with anyone mm -hmm. um and I don't want to overextend myself either at the same time yeah. so we don't really have like a relationship but thankfully she is alive so I think after that I do plan on working on continuing to make efforts to communicate with her mm -hmm. um and if she wants to have a relationship with me then that would be amazing if not, then that's something that, you know, I will have to accept. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the Bible says that God is the mother to the motherless and he's a father to the fatherless. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another reason why I have a close relationship with God, because growing up, because I didn't know who they were, I had to lean on him to be my mother mm -hmm. and my father right not just like my heavenly mother and my father but literally like my mother and my father because I, I didn't really have that guidance mm -hmm. and um unfortunately my adoptive mom she passed away last year and although we didn't really have a good relationship growing up we was able to 
reconcile and um, I was able to ask for forgiveness for my part mm-hmm. and our toxic relationship and um, towards the end of her days I was able to like visit her once in a while while she was like in a nursery home and things of that sort so we was able to like reconcile before she passed away and I'm extremely grateful for that Um, in spite of our dynamics the best thing that she has done for me was she brought me up in church so although she didn't set the best example of what a Christian mother looked like Mm -hmm. she gave me to the best person she could give me to and she gave me to God Mm -hmm. um and God did the rest and so yeah God is still working he's still working out a lot of details within you know myself and my nieces and my nephews because mind you I was separated from them for 20 years and then all of a sudden I meet most of them yeah the day of my brother passing right so it's just like you meet this random woman and it's like oh this is your aunt and you know my nephews are 11 and 12 years old they're like what do you mean this is my aunt <laughs> <laughs> Like, where did she come from? You know, so it's, it, yeah. you know, it's only been 2017. It's only been six years. Mm-hmm. So we're still getting to learn each other. We're still getting to know each other. Um, my siblings and I, we all grew up very differently. I didn't grow up with any of them, right? They had different foster parents. Mm-hmm. And they also was older than I am. They're a few years older than I am. So they was aware of each other. So only me and Shakira was like taken away and didn't know anyone for the past 20 years. So um, God is still working out those details. Um, and he, he it's, it's not done yet. He's not done yet. He's still healing me. I think there's different layer, layers of healing and different levels of healing. Mm-hmm. And um, right now I don't have any like unforgiveness in my heart towards my mom or my adopted mom or anything of that sort. Um, but I'm still healing from like mother wounds and father wounds and mm-hmm. things of that sort. So God is still like doing the work inside of me. And I understand that for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much where I'm at. And I'm thankful because the way he's used my life to like serve other people is powerful. Like even a few years ago, I worked in a shelter for five years and I was a case manager. I ended up being a case manager. I didn't have a degree at that time. Um, and I helped people get a affordable housing. I help them open an HRA case Mm -hmm. so that they can have like, you know, benefits, cash assistance and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. Um, I've helped people apply to school. And so it's a, it's a great full circle. Mm -hmm. It's a great full circle. And one of my favorite scriptures is Romans 8 and 28. Mm -hmm. For we know that all things work together for good for those that love him and those that are called according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the highs and lows of my life Mm -hmm. reflects that all things work together for our good, no matter what, whether it feels good, seems good, or looks good, Mm -hmm. it still works in our favor at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I also love that verse, but I had to learn to love that verse because I also live with chronic pain I'm like, God, how is the pain good? (laughs) Right. Mm. But I'm realizing now through what I've been through, I can share with other people. I've talked to so many people who are like, I can relate. I I've, I live with chronic pain too. So that's the purpose of our suffering. It, It it's fruitful if we wait. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm also happy to hear you, you reconciled with, uh, your adoptive families, uh, your mother. I wish I had the, that opportunity because I didn't. She died in a hospice. I didn't even know when she died, where she died, if there was a funeral, where it was. So I'm happy you got that closure. 
Thank you. Um, and I can't relate in that way, but I also understand of what enclosure that you can't have because I reunified with my family in January 2017. Mm -hmm. And my father passed in October 2016. Wow. So it was very close. And I'm like, God, you couldn't have him wait. <laughs> like, yeah. You couldn't have had this wait. Yeah. <laughs> like he couldn't die two years later or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so God is still working on me with that. Um, because the last time I saw him, I was six years old. Um, and my my we some of us have different fathers and and some of us have different fathers, but the siblings where I share the same father with, they was able to know him in their adult years. They was able to have some form of relationship with them. So when I have conversation, you know, with my sister on my father's side, we have two different viewpoints of how he is. Mm -hmm. He's the person for me that abandoned me and like was you know addicted to drugs for them it's like you know that's the person that raised them so we you know we have different views on who he you know who he is um and so I can understand what enclosure and not having a opportunity to do to to, to have that because with my biological father like I don't have that I don't have the opportunity to ask him about his story and what happened and you know like what 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 went wrong like wh why did you have so many children yeah. Yeah. um when you couldn't take care of the ones you already had like and whatever other question I would want to ask him mm -hmm. so I definitely understand that it's one of those things where f for myself trust in God's sovereignty like that's the only thing I can do yeah um mm -hmm. yeah honestly yeah, yeah. yeah I love that you were talking about healing layers because mm -hmm. some of us it's hard to get to certain layers of healing not because we don't know it's right or correct or that we should do it it's just too painful to do and um I'm proud of you from woman to woman, how much healing you have done and how much you've accomplished, regardless of any obstacles that you faced or continue facing. How are you spreading that love around and helping others heal? I can see that you are, um, you're the founder of Royalty Rubies. Can you tell us more about that? I'm so curious. Thank you. So I think the way that I spread it is to remember what it was like for me growing up, not feeling loved or affirmed. Mm -hmm. And I tried to like overpower people with love. So, you know, my friends, they are very clear mm -hmm. that I love them and I support them because I show up for them consistently. Mm -hmm. Um, I love serving other people. I'm very attentive to people's wants, um, their desires, what make them light up. Um, I empower people. I encourage people because I understand that although they might not have gone through the situations I've gone through, they've gone through something. Mm -hmm. And I never want them to feel alone or unloved or unheard. So I'm really like mindful of that. And as a social worker, I have a lot of teenagers on my caseload and I've made a lot of mistakes as a teenager mm. because I was looking for love in all the wrong places. And I was rushing to grow up, to get out of my situation. And mm. since I can't go back to that stage in my life, I am intentional about affirming the young adults I work with. And I tell them that they can do anything they put their minds to do. So I do my best to, sh to sow good seeds. And so if I know someone wants to be a football player or 
you know, basketball player or anything of that sort, and I know of resources that can help them, I provide them with those resources Mm -hmm. Um, because I want to sow good seeds and I want them to say, my social worker, she believed in me. Miss A, she spoke life into me. She told me I could do anything I put my mind to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the best thing I could offer people is the love of Jesus Christ um, and to tell people about God's love um, and to just show up the best way I know how to. And the more God continues to prune me and like work on me, the best way I could like show up for other people. Mm-hmm. And in terms of royalty and rubies, I'm wearing a shirt now. I don't know if you guys could see it. It says that, it says one that Jesus left the 99 for. Oh, I love that. And <laughs> yes so it's a scripture in the bible that talks about jesus leaving a 99 sheep for the one sheep mm-hmm. um and the idea came about my story like there's been a lot of moments where god left other people to come attend to me because he knew i was about to lose it right so it's just like yeah. let me make sure my daughter aretha is okay i know that she needs something so let me show her that I'm here. Um, and he's done that in like the big testimonies I've just shared, mm-hmm. but even the, the, the small things. So I shared on my Facebook two weeks ago that I told God, like I needed some form of physical touch because I live by myself. I don't have any children. I don't have a partner. And like, I took off from work, which is very, very rare outside of vacation. Mm-hmm. And out of nowhere, my nephew called me and he wanted to come see me and he came to see me with his mother and his brother um and we had a a quick conversation and his mother was like oh he just said he wanted to see you because we walked by your house and he's like I want to see auntie Aretha she's like but she's probably at work but go ahead call her and out of all the days (laughs) that you know I could have been at work that day I wasn't at work um and then I got a hug from my nephew. So I didn't, ass- mm. I'm physical touch. I'm thinking like, you know, a man, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know, a, a hug from a friend. Yeah. Um, but he answered that small prayer that no one knew about. Only God knew about that yeah. by sending my nephew to give me a hug. And I was like, wow, that's so powerful because God knows how I feel about children. I feel like the most purest love you'll ever receive is from a child mm-hmm. um and so even the smallest things like god cares about the smallest things mm-hmm. um and that's that's so amazing to be loved by god and so that's what what, what ro- royalty and rubies is about it's just mm-hmm. affirmation of how loved all of us are um from god and that even if you was the only person in this world God would have still sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you because you're that worthy and you're that valuable to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and he loves all of us unconditionally. It's nothing that we could do or say that would change his mind or his love for us. So that's what that's what it's about. I love that. As you were talking, I circled the word love <laughs> because... Huh. It's it's an easy, tricky topic. Um, and when you were saying looking for love in the wrong places, please don't think that it's just you. I've looked for that as well. And I know countless of others who have done that. It's not that they don't understand the meaning or the word of love. They need to feel it to know what it feels like, right? Um society they 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 have their own definition of love and what love is obviously some people based on where they grew up you know for me in the haiti adoption love was always tied to success i had to do certain things or be good enough but when i wasn't good enough love wasn't given back to me what are your thoughts on the word love and this topic in general I think what you said is correct. I think society has basically um, 
made love as like a transaction Mm. so it's like you know people will love you if you're at a certain status if you have certain assets Mm -hmm. if you're famous if you have a lot of money or you can offer them a certain opportunity but when it comes to the love that I'm talking about I'm talking about the biblical love the real definition of love where it talks about love being patient and kind and long suffering Mm -hmm. and gentleness so the love that God has for us is unconditional. So I can sin today. I could do something that's not so pleasing to God or say something that's not so pleasing to God. Mm-hmm. And he'll still love me. He might not like what I did, but he'll still love me. Um, and he's not like man. Like people, you know, seasons, seasons change, people change. And, and things happen. Um, but with God, like through every season, he loves us during our high moments at the peak of your career, have all the money in the world, got all these, you know, opportunities, fame and assets and accolades. He'll love you. If you're on the street corner, homeless person, prostitute, sex worker, drug dealer, yeah. anything anything you could think of Mm -hmm. um he loves you the same way he doesn't love anyone more or less and that's what I I love about God um because it's not about the outer appearance he said man look on the outer appearance but he looks at the heart um which is what I do my best to focus on is the my heart yeah. Um, when it comes to people, um, because that's what God cares about. He cares about the heart. So for me, I, I appreciate God's love because his love is unconditional. There's no, there's no price to it. Mm-hmm. And it's nothing anybody could do about it. Whether you like me or not, God loves me. Whether I like you or not, God loves you. <laughs> <laughs> so... I love that. I love that. Agape love. I've heard of that word, agape. No clue, yes. but someone expressed it, agape love. Oh, that's the power and the the fierceness of God's love because it's not it's not a love that men can give without him or it's not a love that men can take away once he has given That's mm. what I love so much about it. Um, I want to touch a little bit on bullying. All right, because that's also another massive, massive topic that most kids face, even adults, adults are bullies too, you know. <laughs> so let's focus more about that. Um, share with us your experience as a child being bullied and how that was, and then your thoughts on, I don't know, cranky bullying adults. <laughs> Yeah, it was a tough experience because I didn't have like the designer clothing or the designer shoes and Mm. kids, you know, that's how they value people based off of what you can afford or what you can't afford. Mm -hmm. So it was a difficult experience. Um, You know, I was teased about that. Um, I was also teased because I was in special ed most of my education um so a lot of people tease me about that as well like I will ride what they call the the cheese bus the little bus Mm -hmm. so it it was it was really tough um I did have a few friends but you know the bullying was really intensive when I experienced that and I was jumped about four different times by 50 people for no reason so that was a really difficult experience to go through it was like a a family game in in Harlem at the time so yeah it was it was really really difficult and I'm pretty sure that adults go through that in different situations or for different reasons as well Mm -hmm. um but God definitely helped me get through that that situation um and even those people he's made sure I forgive them too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. I love that you're talking about forgiveness. That's a topic that once in a while, it, it, you know, like a rose, it has a thorn (laughs) 
it kind yeah. of pushed me back a step. Not because I don't want to look at the beauty of it. It's because it's hard. It's triggering something. I've always mm. struggled with forgiveness. But as I am mature, I think I'm matured <laughs> uh, into so many different areas in life. I've learned that forgiveness is not for the people that hurt us. It's for us because mm -hmm. very toxic, I find very, very toxic just to carry those um, very toxic emotions and anger and all that stuff around. So I'm, I'm happy for you that you did find the place in your heart with God's help to forgive. Forgive doesn't mean forget. I always let people know. Listeners find you and your work. So they can find me on all social media platforms. Aretha Boomer. Hmm. A-R-E-T-H-A-B-O-O-M-E-R. -E hmm. So on Facebook, Aretha Boomer. On IG, Aretha Boomer. On TikTok, Aretha Boomer. And in terms of my business, it's royaltyandrubies.com. So royaltyandrubies.com. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, finally, before I let you go, I have five signature five second questions. <laughs> I ask at the end of each episode. Um, the first one is what does potential mean to you? What does potential mean to me? Yes. I think potential means I know it's a big one. <laughs> I'm going to say the ability to do something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I love I'm going to say the ability to do something. Because um, when I think of potential, I, I think of it like, I think of it like, a person that could grow into something mm. um whether it's becoming a better man a better husband a better wife a better mother like you have the potential to do something so it's like you have like a seed or something like that mm -hmm. that can grow mm -hmm. but it will probably need some time right so it's like with like a piece of fruit or if you're trying to grow something the seed is the potential but you still need water you need soil you need sun mm -hmm. so when I think about potential mm -hmm. I think about I think about a seed potential is a, a seed mm -hmm. so you have the seed but you still need some ingredients to grow mm -hmm. I love that uh who is your favorite author um, I don't think I have a favorite author because I'm still trying to grow a love for reading. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so I don't think I have a favorite author, mm -hmm. but I will say the ones. new book I just got is T.D. T. D. Jake's new book, Disruptive oh, wow. Thinking. Yeah. And I am excited about reading that book <laughs> mm, I want to get that book too I've been I watch his sermons every Sunday I don't miss one Sunday and I'm getting that book as well thank you for sharing um do you like cats or dogs cats nice um what's your favorite movie Whew, I have a lot love and basketball two can play that game mm-hmm Nice. Bring it on. I like the, the classic movies. Nice. Tyler Perry. I love Tyler Perry. Oh, yeah. I me too. I really love Tyler Perry. So. Yeah. So you said you sing and dance. Uh, are you able to sing something before I let you go? Oh, no, I don't sing. I don't sing. If I could sing, I would have been wealthy by now. But I can dance. <laughs> ah, that's <laughs> I awesome. I can dance. Yeah. I can Thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been so, so beautiful just to connect and to share your story. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, this was a really great interview. I definitely appreciate the opportunity. It was a pleasure just meeting you and being on your platform and learning more of your story as well and how our our stories may be different in a lot of ways, but it's also very similar mm -hmm. in a lot of ways as well. So just learning more about you um, is amazing. And what you're doing with your podcast is beautiful. Just, you know, giving people space to share their story mm -hmm. in their own way and just, you know, being authentic, I think that's a beautiful thing. And I definitely pray that God continues to bless your platform and also grants you the desires of your heart and continue to show you his faithfulness. Mm -hmm. um, thank yes, you. thank you. So